Link Carter, and I will be your moderator for tonight's presentation. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. We've taken a screenshot of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right corner. You have joined the presentation listening using your computer speaker system by default. This means if you can hear music through your computer, you should be able to hear the presentation. If you would prefer to join over the telephone, just select Use Telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address as many as possible at the end. Now let's begin today's educational webcast, New Oral Treatments. During today's presentation, Dr. Jeff Crowley will discuss the ins and outs of this new mode of treatment for psoriatic disease. First, on behalf of the National Psoriasis Foundation, we extend our thanks to Celgene for their sponsorship of today's educational webcast and for making this presentation possible. Before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to take a moment to tell those of you who may be new to the foundation about who we are, our mission, and what we do. The National Psoriasis Foundation is the world's largest nonprofit patient advocacy organization dedicated to psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis and we serve as the voice for millions of Americans who are affected by these diseases. Our mission is to drive efforts to cure psoriatic disease and improve the lives of those affected. In order to move our mission forward, we engage thousands of volunteers around the country in activities that will lead to a cure. Nationwide, our volunteers are visiting their local elected officials, asking Congress to support legislation to increase access to treatment and funding for psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis research raising money and awareness through our Team MPF events, and educating the public about psoriatic disease through the Community Ambassador Volunteer Program. For more information about these opportunities, log on to our website after today's program, www.psoriasis.org. Now I would like to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Jeffrey Crowley. Dr. Crowley is a dermatologist in private practice at Bakersfield Dermatology and Skin Cancer Group in Bakersfield, California. Dr. Crowley specializes in the treatment of psoriasis. Dr. Crowley received his medical degree and completed his medical internship and dermatology residency, including service as chief resident at Stanford University in California. He has served as faculty at both Stanford and the University of California, Los Angeles. Dr. Crowley is a member of the American Academy of Dermatology, CalDerm, American Society of Mohs Surgery, and the American Society of Dermatological Surgeons. Dr. Crowley is a President's Counsel and former medical board member of the National Psoriasis Foundation. He has been involved in drafting guidelines for the treatment of psoriasis. Dr. Crowley has published over 30 peer-reviewed peer journal articles on such topics as the effect of tumor necrosis factor on neutrophil function, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, and the treatment of psoriasis. Dr. Crowley has been involved in uh, phase two, phase three, and post-marketing studies with several biologics, and he has served as principal investigator for over 30 clinical trials. Welcome, Dr. Crowley. We are so pleased to have you here today. I will now hand it over to you. Oh, thank you so much. And uh, I really do believe that, you know, the National Psoriasis Foundation is the voice for advocacy uh, for our patients with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. There really is no other home for that uh, in the nation. And so it's a great organization. I do recommend becoming a member uh, and you'll, you will certainly get more out of it than uh, your membership fee. So today we're going to talk about the new oral treatments and newer oral treatments. One of them has been approved for a, a while now, over a year um, for psoriasis and for psoriatic arthritis. Uh, as full disclosure, I'm not getting paid to give this talk, but I have been uh, an investigator for pretty much every biologic uh, agent that and and oral agent for psoriasis over the last come out over the last uh, 12 years, uh, and continue to be an investigator for uh, some of the new products that are being developed uh, right now, and have also served as a consultant for uh, most of these companies as well, including Celgene, which is a sponsor uh, of this uh, of this presentation. All right. There we go. So outline of today's presentation, we're going to define what traditional systemic medications are. 
uh, and, and compare and contrast those with biologic medications and the new oral treatments. We're going to talk about a Tesla, the safety, side effects, the dosing, some of the unique aspects of this drug, talk a little bit about Zelgans and JAK inhibitors, and then additional oral treatments that are in development. There's a list of those uh, with various different targets uh, inside the cell. And then pretty much, you know, we're going to want to spend a bulk of the time answering questions that you may have uh, about this, uh, these treatments. So what is a systemic treatment? What defines it? Um, and what do I consider a patient that's appropriate for systemic treatments? So I think of psoriasis really in, in two forms. One is something that you can manage with topical therapy. Um, and, you know, when it's very small areas of involvement or uh, just a, a single area or a few areas, a few percentage uh, of the body, you know, you can often manage that with topical therapy, maybe some phototherapy. And then there's everything else, and everything else I consider psoriasis, which really needs to be you know, addressed in a systemic way. Psoriasis, of course, is a systemic inflammatory disease. Um, we know that. You know, you're not only just inflamed in your skin, we also know you can be inflamed in your joints, uh, and you can be inflamed elsewhere in the body uh, as well, and some people to more degrees than others. But it is a systemic inflammatory disease. A systemic treatment is really appropriate for those with moderate to severe disease. In moderate disease, I consider that patient who has more than a handful of psoriasis and where topical therapies just isn't cutting it. Um, and certainly, should, you should try topical therapies uh, prior to going on to systemic therapies. Uh, but if it's you know, widespread to begin with, I will consider systemic therapy uh, you know, uh, from the get-go. Usually, they're taken by mouth. Uh, in liquid or pill form or given by injection into the skin or muscle uh, or through uh, intravenous injection. Uh, drugs such as infliximab, um, also known in trade name as Rimicade, is, uh, is one of the infusion uh, drugs that we have to treat psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. So there are traditional systemics, the biologics, and then some of these newer oral treatments. We'll go over each of those. So the traditional systemic uh, treatments, small molecule drugs, with small molecule mean there's something that could be absorbed into the body orally. If you give a biologic into the body, it's going to be chewed up by stomach acid um, and by other enzymes, and it's not going to make it into the body. So biologics are proteins uh, that uh, would not be able to be absorbed uh, through the uh, GI tract. So small molecules can penetrate through the GI tract uh, and then are absorbed into the body uh, where they are uh, active. So they're essentially chemicals uh, derived from other chemicals and they are chemically synthesized and purified. Uh, examples are cyclosporin, methotrexate, uh, and psoriatane. Cyclosporin, interestingly, was a actually derived from uh, a, a product that was made by uh, a, a microorganism um, and then was, then was created synthetically in the lab. Methotrexate we've had for many years uh, has been kind of uh, mainstay for treating uh, both psoriasis and even psoriatic arthritis uh, over the years. And then psoriatane, which also known as acetretin, uh, is a vitamin A derivative. So it's actually a derivative of a vitamin um, that can be useful for certain types of psoriasis. Biologics are proteins. Um, they're large molecules and they're derived from living cells in a laboratory through various techniques, including cell culture, um, some are derived from mammalian cells, others from, uh, from bacteria. Uh, examples are vaccines, insulin, uh, one of the original uh, biologic drugs, uh, and living cells used in cell therapy. There's a lot of interest in stem cell therapy now, um, so that would be also a type of biologic treatment. So how do biologics work? So again, they're given by injection. Uh, or IV infusion. Usually this is just a subcutaneous injection, so it doesn't have to be a deep uh, injection. And they target specific parts of the immune system that are active, or in, in a, actually overactive, uh, in patients with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. And so some of the targets of these are things like tumor necrosis factor alpha, which we know is significantly elevated in patients with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. And by decreasing TNF-alpha levels, we can definitely make an improvement in many patients uh, with these two diseases. Other targets are interleukins 12 and 23, particularly IL-23 in that group, uh, and one of the newer agents uh, in biologic-wise targets uh, IL-17A, 
uh, L17, which is even a little bit more of a specific target uh, in psoriasis. It may also have some effect in, uh, in arthritis as well. So the available meds for psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis are Enbrel, Etanercept, Humira, Adalimumab, Remicade, which is Infliximab, Stolera, which is Ustic Inumab, uh, Cosentix, um, which is Secukinumab, Simzia, uh, which is Acertalizumab, and Symphony. Uh, Symphony is only, which is Golimumab, and Symphony is only approved uh, for psoriatic arthritis as well as Simzia only approved for psoriatic arthritis, not for psoriasis. However, Simzia is currently being studied for uh, psoriasis. Symphony, the dosing probably is not going to be adequate to control most patients with psoriasis. So we have quite a few agents that have all been developed over the last really 12 to uh, 15 years uh, to treat our patients and to treat you, uh, our patients with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. So why do we need other treatments? Well, you know, a lot of patients want to try something, try to try a pill. They don't want to do an injection, or they're not really ready to do something that may, uh, you know, affect the immune system in that way. And so there is a lot of interest in oral agents uh, for psoriasis. Uh, and it's nice to see some new products that are developed, because basically with methotrexate, cyclosporin, and acetretin, psoriatane, we really didn't have anything else that was in the pipeline until recently. Um, so these are small molecules delivered by mouth, uh, selectively target molecules inside the immune system. They modulate the complex inflammatory processes within the cells. So they change what proteins are being made, what kind of inflammatory cytokines are being produced uh, within the cell, uh, and, uh, and, and then really change the development of what is released by the cells, okay, these cytokines that are released by the cells. And they can correct the overactive immune system that causes the inflammation uh, that's present in patients with uh, psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. Now, there are some downsides to a small molecule. One of those is that they can have effect on kidneys and liver, um, and so they need to be tested for those things. And um, you know, the, the newer agents such as uh, such as a Tesla doesn't seem to have much effect on those uh, those things. There is some adjustment for. Uh, kidneys, but very, very little effect seen. But some of the other agents may. Methotrexate certainly can affect the liver and liver enzymes. It can also affect at higher doses of blood counts. And cyclosporin can affect uh, the kidney function. So, you know, with the oral agents, they're not necessarily more, more safe than biologics. They're different, and there's different safety profile. And that's important to understand. Just because you're taking it by mouth doesn't mean it's a safer drug than, an, uh, than a biologic drug. Um, it's just a different way of delivering an agent, and all of these drugs have their unique kind of safety efficacy profile. So that brings us to uh, Otesla. So it was approved uh, in March of 2014 for psoriatic arthritis. So in March, next year will be two years of approval of psoriatic arthritis, and then quickly following in September of 2014, it was approved for martyr to severe psoriasis. And it targets an enzyme called phosphodiesterase 4, which is an enzyme found in cells, and particularly in inflammatory cells, that regulates cyclic AMP. And if you ever took a biology class in high school or college, uh, you know that cyclic AMP is really kind of as an energy center in, in the cell. And levels of, of relative levels of cyclic AMP uh, are important in what's going on in the cell. And inflammatory cells that is true as well. So it promotes the production of pro-inflammatory mediators, phosphodiesterase 4 does. So the idea is that if you block phosphodiesterase 4, you should decrease pro-inflammatory mediators and help inflammatory disease. Um, and so what we found uh, with phosphodiesterase 4 being blocked by a primalast is that you do get improvements. You do get decreases in some of the pro-inflammatory cytokines you do see improvement in skin and joint disease. Um, and phosphodiesterase 4 is definitely important in diseases such as psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, uh, and it's kind of uh, uh, the enthesopathy, which is similar to PSA and closing spondylitis. And as you see in the cartoon, here is a picture of a primalast blocking phosphodiesterase 4, uh, leading to increased cyclic AMP levels because it's preventing the breakdown of cyclic AMP to AMP. 
Latesla dosing and monitoring. It's taken twice daily, and it really needs to be taken twice daily to get uh, the uh, the benefits from it. Um, sometimes I do have some patients, uh, if they're having issues with the GI, which we'll talk a little bit more about, uh, GI disturbance, you know, nausea or things like that. So maybe start with once a day, uh, but it is taken twice daily. And the dosing begins with a five-day titration period. And the titration period is designed specifically to help with nausea, vomiting, diarrhea that can occur in some patients. It's not all patients. can occur in some patients uh, when they start this drug. Or Tesla has no requirement for routine laboratory monitoring. And some of these studies with shoreneck arthritis also had patients who were on methotrexate, uh, so they weren't just on just a Tesla alone. But in the studies that were done, there was no indication of anything. On white blood cell counts, okay, all critically important things that you want to, to measure, and there was nothing going on with that. So the FDA uh, did not see it necessary to have mon monitoring included uh, with the Tesla. There are some special populations which need adjust adjusting doses, and this includes people with severe uh, kidney disease. So people with pretty low renal function um, should. Um, follow a different uh, schedule for their titration, and then they basically should be just on daily dosing of the Otesla. And Otesla has not been studied for pregnant or nursing women, and Otesla has not been studied in patients 18 of years of age or younger, at least as of yet. Um, so it's only approved for adults with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. So what is the efficacy in Hi, everyone. It seems like we're having some audio difficulties. Um, Dr. Crowley, if you could hear me, if you could possibly try dialing out through your phone line instead of the computer, we may be able to, to fix this. And thanks, folks, for just standing by while we figure this out here. Hi there, Dr. Crowley, not sure if you can hear me, but if you can just connect through your phone line, I think we should be able to address this audio issue. Hello? Oh, hi, Dr. Crowley. How long have I been out? Hi, so I don't think we got any information on the slide that's up right now, this efficacy of psoriasis slide. Okay, so let's just start right with that. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much, and thanks everybody for hanging tight there while we work that out. All right, we're all back. We're back going, right? Yes, we're back going. Right, I'm sorry you about that. And hear you. So efficacy in psoriasis. So uh, the clinical trial data with the Tesla, um, over 1,400 patients were in the clinical trials, and about 30% of these patients achieved a 75% improvement in their psoriasis, okay, after three, after four months, so at 16 weeks. So what is a 75% improvement in psoriasis? So that is a pretty 
good improvement. So, you know, usually you're pretty happy when you have 75% of your disease go away. Now, we measure this in a little different way. We use something called a PASI score, and we look for a change of 75% from the baseline. So we measure you when you start and then measure you uh, over time and at the end of therapy uh, and see how you've done. So 30% of patients got a good response of their psoriasis, a solid response of their psoriasis. And about 20% of patients were clear or almost clear with their psoriasis. About one in five patients pretty much cleared their psoriasis at the end of 16 weeks. So psoriasis disease severity is determined by that redness, the thickness, the plaque, and the affected amount of area on the body. Again, that's the PASI area. We also measure other things like itching and quality of life measures, uh, like, you know, how are you feeling about, are you able to do the activities that you want to do, how much impact is the psoriasis having on you uh, at that point. Let's see, I think. Going to advance here. There we go. So the most common side effects of Otesla are diarrhea, nausea, upper respiratory tract infection, and headache. Um, so what, what percentage of patients had diarrhea and nausea? It was more than 10%, but less than 20%. So that's kind of in that range. Um, and that usually was up front. So most patients who had this problem had it in the first few weeks. Um, upper respiratory tract infection, headache, those are kind of seen pretty much in every study that we do. Uh, and usually they are higher than placebo. Um, but those are common things that we see uh, in studies. How do you manage these side effects? Well, nausea and diarrhea, again, most commonly occurs in those first two weeks and does tend to resolve over time. It doesn't always resolve over time, but for most folks, it does. Uh, and you can talk to your healthcare provider about strategies to manage GI upset, but here are some of them, okay? Uh, one, you can take it with food, especially with milder foods, such as bananas, white rice, applesauce, especially if you're having, uh, you know, diarrhea, upset stomach. Uh, drink plenty of fluids, so you stay hydrated. Um, you, may, you may want to even something like a, a Gatorade, Pedialyte, something like that. Um, and use probiotics, because uh, they can help kind of stabilize your GI tract. Um, and limit the dairy intake as the dairy can be more difficult to digest um, otherwise. And then there are always, you know, there are things like Imodium, which can help with uh, diarrhea, chaopectate, Pepto-Bismol. Those are things that can help get you through that initial phase with this medication that some people uh, experience. Risks. You know, with every medicine we have, there are some risks. And these are fairly well established uh, in, the, in the clinical trials. Uh, with this drug, and there's depression and suicidal behavior. So it sounds kind of ominous, but let's actually look at, at the numbers. So in clinical trials for psoriatic arthritis, 1% of people treated with a test of reported depression compared with 0.8% treated with placebo. Okay, And in clinical trials for psoriasis, 1.3% of people treated with test of reported depression compared to 0.4% treated with placebo. So it definitely was a higher rate there. Okay, more patients on a Tesla having uh, some depression. Again, still we're talking 1%, 1.3%, so fairly low numbers, but definitely something to discuss with your doctor. Um, you know, this, especially if you've had an issue with depression in the past, or you're feeling depressed at the time you're going to start about going on therapy, uh, or you're already on an antidepressant, um, you know, this is something you definitely want to discuss uh, with your doctor. That being said, um, you know, the, in terms of completed suicides uh, in the Tesla group, uh, in psoriasis uh, studies, there weren't any. There was one in the placebo group. So um, something to be aware of. Weight decrease. Now, that doesn't sound too bad. Weight decrease between 5 and 10% of body weight was reported in about 10% of people treated with a Tesla. And that was as early as that 16-week mark. So even fairly early on, some patients drop weight. Now, not everyone loses weight. And it's not just heavier folks who lose weight. Lighter folks can lose weight, too. But weight loss that led to having to stop the drug, discontinue the drug, those levels were very, very low. 
Uh, so this may actually be something that's beneficial. It does seem like the weight loss also decreases somewhat over time, so it doesn't continue, kind of gets to a plateau. And the other important thing is that the weight loss is not associated with nausea or diarrhea. So patients who get nausea and diarrhea do not have more weight loss than people who don't. So there's something else going on. Either it suppresses your appetite or it, you're burning more calories for some reason, but we're not exactly sure. There are some animal models suggesting that maybe your, your fat's a little more active in terms of uh, of uh, burning through uh, calories. Um, there's some evidence that it may be more of a central uh, mechanism decreasing your appetite somewhat. But something I think that can be managed. Hey, Dr. Crowley, so sorry to cut in. Just before we move on to the other treatments, I believe we skipped over the slide about the psoriatic arthritis trials for Tesla. Do you mind if I take us back there real quick? No. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Here we are. Perfect. Um, Thanks, perfect. Again. So efficacy in psoriatic arthritis. So there were, you know, several trials in psoriatic arthritis. Uh, we actually were one of the study centers for one of them, and almost 1,500 patients. So this is a lot of patients for a psoriatic arthritis trial, and about 38% of the patients saw a 20% improvement in their uh, in their arthritis severity score. This is also known as the ACR20. So the patient the percentage of patients that achieved an ACR20 was 38% after 16 week course. Now some of these patients were on baseline stable doses of methotrexate because that was allowed, uh, but some of the patients were just on monotherapy. And now there were two different doses in these studies, uh, but the 30 milligram dose worked better than the 20 milligram dose. So that is the approved dose for both psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. So arthritis severity scores are a little different from skin disease and that they're determined by the swelling around the joints, joint tenderness, pain, physical function, and morning stiffness. So some of this is actually reported by the patient, whereas the PASI score in skin disease is just reported, you know, something that's observed by the doctor or the provider, not by the patient. So a little bit of a difference there uh, in terms of how the diseases are assessed. And some patients did achieve an ACR 50, so 50% improvement, and some patients did achieve an ACR 70. 70% improvement in their arthritis, uh, and all of those uh, were uh, greater than seen with placebo treatment. All right, so now I think you can jump us back forward. So now we'll move on to uh, some of the other treatments. So there is a uh, approved product, uh, which is a JAK inhibitor, okay, that's called Zeljans and that's been approved to treat rheumatoid arthritis. It also has been studied in psoriasis and uh, psoriatic arthritis. So it is a JAK kinase inhibitor, and these block different uh, forms of enzymes. Okay? There, are, there are different specificities for these compounds. Uh, there's a JAK1, JAK2, JAK3, and tyrosine kinase 2, or also known as TIC2. Uh, and these four uh, different enzymes uh, can be affected different ways from these JAK inhibitors. Uh, JAK is really important in cell signaling and it leads to the inflammatory response and immune responses. So if you shut JAK off completely, you shut off your immune response effectively. Uh, there are currently are two JAK inhibitors that are approved by the FDA to treat blood diseases and as I mentioned earlier, rheumatoid arthritis. So they're also being studied for efficacy uh, and safety in myeloproliferative diseases. Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, myelofibrosis, which is a bone marrow cancer condition, uh, and alopecia, alopecia areata in particular. So Zeljans, also known as tofacitinib, is a JAK inhibitor and it works within cells to target the JAK pathways uh, that signal activities of cytokines. And it was approved way back in 2012 to treat rheumatoid arthritis and it's now been uh, used in, in multiple other clinical trials uh, looking at other conditions. It's taken twice a day and again it's been studied in uh, patients with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. So the current status. Uh, so they presented their information on psoriasis to the FDA and in psoriasis there were two different doses. There was a 5 milligram dose which is the dose that's already approved in RA and there was a 10 milligram dose and in psoriasis the 10 milligram dose worked a lot better and the 5 milligram dose. But there were some questions about the safety of the higher dose. And there were some 
dose-dependent changes in safety profile. So in other words, there were some more infectious events and things seen with the 10 milligram dose compared to the 5 milligram dose. So the FDA wants some more information. Uh, and so the company uh, is deciding what to do with that information uh, and what, what, how they'll go forward. Uh, but they do uh, appear in all of their releases to be committed uh, to getting this therapy available for you. And again, phase three trials in uh, psoriatic arthritis um, are still underway. Other oral treatments in development, FP187, this is in phase three study uh, for psoriasis. This is a dimethyl fumarate treatment. Now these treatments, these fumarates have been used in Europe for many, many years. And in fact, oral fumarates, or oral fumaric acid esters are the leading oral therapy in Germany and some other European countries. Um, and they can be very effective. They also have a lot of GI issues, gastrointestinal issues uh, in terms of tolerance. But they have been used for many years uh, in the world um, and are actually moving forward uh, with a specific version of this product uh, in terms of psoriasis getting approved and looking for approval uh, in the United States. CF101, uh, this is in phase three. And this is an adenosine A3 receptor inhibitor, uh, which is an anti-inflammatory product. There's baricitinib, which is another JAK inhibitor. This is a JAK1 and JAK2 inhibitor. And it's in uh, it's completed phase two studies for psoriasis. And this is uh, manufactured by Eli, Eli Lilly and Insight. Uh, and then there's KD025, phase two studies for psoriasis. And this is a ROC2 inhibitor also known as the oral anti-IL-17 uh, because it does decrease uh, IL-17 uh, levels. Important to note on those, uh, on those other medicines is that they're all still uh, in development. And so uh, we don't know whether those are going to see the light of day and be available uh, for you to use to treat your psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis. Uh, but just it, it's important to know that there are new things that are coming down the pike. And you know, we're continually trying to find things that are effective for our patients with minimal risk, that are convenient for our patients, yet really allow them to control their disease uh, and live their lives. Um, so I think now if I'm still uh, connected, uh, we yeah. can move on to some <laughs> questions and answers. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Crowley. So we're going to go ahead and dive into the Q&A session of this webcast. We've gotten a lot of great questions from our participants, uh, both before this presentation and during it. So folks, go ahead and keep those coming, and we'll get to as many as we can now. Uh, so we'll start here, Dr. Crowley. So how did these medications affect people with psoriasis who have had cancer in the past? It's a good question. You know, and that's and that's not an uncommon thing because cancer is really a survivable disease for most people that get cancer now. Um, and unfortunately, in the clinical trials, you know, we don't get a lot of cancer information because patients who have had previous cancers are not allowed to go into the trials in general, especially if you've had a breast cancer or colon cancer. Um, they usually let patients that have had a basal cell skin cancer per se, per, or a localized squamous cell skin cancer or maybe some early cervical uh, changes uh, are allowed into the trials, but most patients aren't. So most of our cancer cancer data actually comes from registries, which is more limited. Um, so you know there was no cancer signal seen in the studies with a Tesla. In other words, we didn't see issues with higher cancer rates than we would expect for in, in a population. Um, and there really doesn't appear to be a significant immunosuppressive effect of a Tesla. We're not seeing, you know, increased infections besides the upper respiratory tract infections. We're not seeing, you know, herpes zoster, shingles, those kind of things. So I think there is some there's some comfort level in terms of using this in patients who have had cancer, but the data upon which that is based is very limited. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, good to know. Is it safe to use a Tesla as at the same time as you're taking a biologic? So there have been no, you know, studies, no official studies looking at the combination of a Tesla and a biologic, and certainly it is not approved for use in combination with a biologic therapy. Okay. That being said, there are some physicians who are using the combination. So, for instance, if you have a patient who's doing pretty well 
uh, with their arthritis, but their psoriasis just isn't quite there. It's getting better, but not quite there. You know, adding on a Tesla may help push that patient to a point where they're more satisfied. Um, there certainly is some comfort in the fact that a Tesla does not appear uh, to be very immunosuppressive, if at all. Um, whereas, you know, so you're not really adding another immunosuppressive therapy to the biologic. And this is certainly an area that needs a lot more study. Because right now, uh, it's still experimental if that's being, you know, when that's being done. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Are any of these oral medications safe for someone with severe depression? Yeah, you know, severe depression is, is tough. I certainly don't think that, that Tesla would be where I would go because it does have a depressive signal. Um, you know, we've even had some biologics in development which have maybe had a depressive signal. Um, so, you know, that, that, that's tough. But, you know, one way to probably improve your depression is to improve your skin and your joints. Um, so certainly I have a lot of patients who are on antidepressants, have had issues with depression, who we treat with all of the agents, um, including, you know, biologics, um, and, and, and do well. Um, so I, I don't think it should be an exclusion to being on anything, but because of the depression uh, signal, uh, even though it's very small with a Tesla, it wouldn't be my first choice for someone who has severe depression. Okay, thank you. We've gotten a lot of questions from folks about uh, the long-term data about Otesla and how long it can uh, be expected to remain effective. So one question here from a participant. Based on studies, how long can the medication be consumed before it becomes ineffective? So patients who do well on a Tesla, in general, continue to do well on a Tesla. So, you know, there is data out to one year. Uh, we'll be having data out to two years, uh, you know, in terms of efficacy numbers. Uh, and patients who stay on the drug and are doing well continue to do well. So there's really no limit in terms of what you can expect. If you're doing well, uh, you're likely to continue to do well. Now, with any medication, sometimes it stops working. You know, and this happens with all of our treatments. And that could be because there's maybe other things that are triggering the psoriasis, maybe stress, other issues, infection, uh, or just a change in the psoriasis overall. Or you start developing psoriatic arthritis that you've never had before. You know, all of those things can happen uh, over time. And that can be a reason why it can appear that the drug's not continuing to work. But with the Tesla, in general, if you do well, so if you're one of those patients who achieve a good response at week 16, you're likely to continue that. And that, that data is all being published uh, will be, uh, and should be out in the literature soon as far as longer term both safety and efficacy data. So safety is the other issue. You know what, so what about long term safety? So the trials are still going on. They're still ongoing, the trials in psoriasis. So there's still safety data being collected there. Um, and then, of course, there is the Corona registry, uh, which patients, some patients on a Tesla are entering into. Um, so we should get some safety information about the drug there. And then there's post-marketing surveillance. So there's, you know, if you see uh, as a physician or a patient, if you have a funny thing that happens to you while you're on a drug, if you report that, you know, that's helpful. Uh, because if you get multiple reports, then you know there might be a signal of something that wasn't seen in the clinical trials. Because uh, clinical trial patients are different than general patients. Uh, they, you know, don't have, uh, you know, active liver disease or, uh, you know, high alcohol intake or other things that can uh, be a factor of had previous cancers, those kind of things. So it's important to have those, that information as well. Great. Thank you. A number of questions as well from folks who are curious about uh, whether or not to switch to one of these new oral treatments from a biologic. Uh, here's one question in particular. If a biologic is working well to manage psoriatic arthritis, are there any benefits to switching to an oral treatment like Otesla? If your therapy is working well for you and you're tolerating it well, I would not switch. Mm -hmm. I would not switch to another biologic. I would not switch to an oral unless you're having a problem with the actual treatment. Um, that would be my recommendation. Now, if the therapy was working for you well for you and then it started not working so well, or you're having a problem with it, like you're getting an infection or something like that, uh, then it would be reasonable to switch. Um, but if you're doing well on a therapy, I would not recommend going off. 
Okay, great. And I have a related question here. What are your thoughts on someone trying an oral medication and stopping, for example, Embryl? Is it okay to try and then go back to Embryl, or will Embryl still continue to work? So that that's a good uh, a good scenario there. So with Embryl, um, you know, we don't have a lot of problems with with antibody formation and. And, and people can generally stop it and then restart it again and still achieve uh, what they had before. And that's true with the other biologics to a certain extent, but not as much as it is with Embrel. So, you know, if you wanted to give yourself a break from Embrel and try out Tesla, um, you know, that would certainly be a reasonable thing to do. And then you could always go back to the Embrel if you didn't achieve the results that you wanted uh, with the Tesla. Um, so that that's probably one of the scenarios where I think it would be, you know if that was something that my patient wanted to do I would support them in, in trying it because I do know that they could likely go back to Embrel and still get back to where they were before. Great. Got a number of questions from folks um, curious about that efficacy data we showed from the clinical trials uh, and whether we can kind of contextualize some of those those patients that didn't see the 75 percent improvement in their symptoms what what did happen to them so um, did they experience any level of, of clearance or improvement or was it uh, basically nothing um, is there any way to generalize about what happened to the the rest of the patients on that um, Tesla trial absolutely so a lot of patients achieved a passive 50 response over 50 percent of patients achieved a passive 50 response so they had 50 percent uh, improvement in, in their psoriasis. Uh, and then there were some patients who really didn't have much improvement at all, you know, that, that had less than a 25% improvement in their psoriasis. And what I usually you know, do with my uh, Tesla patients, if I'm not seeing something, if they're not feeling better and their skin's not getting better at two months of therapy uh, at all, then I think it's not likely going to work for them. But if we're seeing even a hint of improvement at two months, I really think it's worth staying for the four months to see what you're going to get out of it uh, at that, you know, that end point. Because it is a slower acting drug. Um, it's not real fast. Um, and so even though your itch might improve really quickly, the skin takes a while to really respond. Um, and it, apparently, you know, in, in talking with Dr. Uh, Phil Meese, who uh, was integral in some of the psoriatic arthritis trials, he even thinks it may be a little slower in PSA, that it may take even six months uh, to see uh, the complete effect in psoriatic arthritis. Um, so I think you have to give something a fair shake. But if you're not seeing anything with a Tesla at two months, um, you know, it's probably not going to do much for you over time. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, can you speak a little bit to information for pregnant women or nursing moms it would o Tesla be a safe option to consider for those folks? So there is no information. So it, you know, the tests have not been done, studies have not been done. Uh, there's really nothing, um, and so it would not be, you know, my recommendation to use a Tesla in someone who is actively trying to get pregnant, or someone who is pregnant or breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, do these oral meds work as well for someone who has tried biologics before? So they didn't work quite as well. So uh, there, there was an analysis done uh, in terms of looking at patients who were previously treated on a biologic or previously failed a biologic, and those patients didn't do quite as well as patients who haven't been on a biologic before. So you know, in my practice, I really think the appropriate place to place a Tesla uh, is before a biologic therapy. Not the only way that I use it, but I think that's probably the, the right place to do it. And I think it's in a patient, you know, who may not be as severe, uh, some of the patients that I would want to start right on, uh, you know, a biologic. Um, so even though it's approved uh, with the same approval wording as, as it is for the biologics, and in fact the patients in the clinical trial had to have that 10% body surface area and were just about uh, as severe as patients in the biologic trials, I really think it, this is more of a pre-biologic medication uh, is the best use for it, and where you're going to see the most benefit from this drug. Great. Uh, a lot of questions as well about cost. So is Otesla, is it a treatment that's cheaper than the biologics like Embrol or Humira? So it's not cheap, uh, you know, and, and none of our therapies are, and, and I'm sure some of the patients on the line have even, you know, recently had issues with their topical steroids, their generic topical steroids costing, you know, now hundreds and hundreds of dollars 
which used to be you know a, a twelve dollar thing at Walmart. Um, so you know cost is is an issue. A Tesla is expensive. Uh, it's not as expensive as an entry level biologic like Embraer or Humira, um, and it's certainly not as expensive as something like, like Stellara or Crescentix. Uh, but it is expensive. It's over you know over twenty thousand dollars a year for therapy. Uh, so it's not cheap, and there's and, and insurance understands that, and uh, they may you know have you jump through some hoops before they approve it. Um, and certainly that kind of varies around the country. Uh, when it varies certainly a lot with what insurance plans uh, you have. There is a lot of help from the companies if you ask for it. You know, you actually ask for it to get copay assistance uh, and to get in, uh, help with getting uh, the insurance uh, to cover their share. Uh, so there can be resources out there. There also are a foundation support for patients who don't have a lot of resources and uh, have uh, you know lower incomes uh, that can get uh, help from the company uh, or a, a third party uh, to help pay for their drug. And we've utilized all those resources in our office to help us access drug for patients, and they've all been successful uh, at times uh, for our patients. Great, thank you. Uh, is it safe to take a Tesla alongside phototherapy? So again, it has not been studied in combination with phototherapy. Do I have patients uh, with photo th on phototherapy and taking a Tesla? Yes. Um, and what is the rationale of uh, my comfort with that? It's that again, a Tesla does not appear to be a photosensitizing drug, so it doesn't make you more sensitive to light. Uh, and a Tesla does not appear, appear to be an immunosuppressive drug. So you know, one of the concerns we have with phototherapy is potential for skin cancer. Even though narrow band UVB, that's a relatively low risk. Uh, but we don't want to add on to that. You know? um, so I think the combination is certainly a reasonable combination. Uh, we also use it in combination with uh, the laser therapies uh, for you know, the extract and uh, uh, laser therapies for psoriasis as well. Okay, but thank it's you. not indicated in the package insert. Gotcha. Do we know anything yet about how uh, Otesla performs in terms of treating psoriasis in specific skin sites, for example, uh, hands and feet or nails or scalp psoriasis? Great question. So uh, just uh, a couple weeks ago uh, in the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology, we published uh, the reports of the subset of patients with scalp psoriasis and with nail psoriasis. Uh, and a Tesla had a significant impact on both conditions. Uh, over two-thirds of patients having significant improvement, clear, almost clear, on their scalp disease, uh, and about half of patients having at least a 50% improvement in their nail disease. So it can impact nail disease, it can impact scalp disease. Hand and foot disease is a little uh, less uh, clear. Um, in the trials that were done so far, the data uh, is not conclusive in terms of what happens with hand and foot disease. That being said, uh, anecdotally, uh, you know, we've had patients in our practice who have had hand and foot uh, psoriasis that have done well with the Tesla. But that's a little harder disease to treat. It's a little different. There are even different genetic factors that go into palmar plantar psoriasis, hand and foot psoriasis. Uh, and it often takes a combination of things to really get a patient under control with that disease. Great, thank you. Question here from someone with a, another health condition to consider. So they say, I have liver damage after many years on methotrexate. Would either of these new treatments, assuming the Tesla or Zelgens, be an option? Yeah, I think, I think both would. Um, certainly a Tesla um, you know, with liver disease, especially if you, you have had a significant hit to your liver, you're also somewhat immunosuppressed. Um, and so that's a little concern. We will be a little concerned with, with, with Zelgans. Um, with the Atesla, um, you know, I think that's something that with proper monitoring, um, you know, could certainly be used and might even be a preferred treatment uh, for, uh, compared to some others uh, for a patient with that condition. Thank you. Um, is it is there any risk of taking Otesla with the herpes virus? Yeah, there is no immunosuppressive signal with uh, with uh, you know Otesla. So uh, patients did not have increased uh, herpes virus infections. 
uh, they did not have sh shingles uh, reported those kind of things so we don't see any risk with that um, now you obviously want to be adequately controlled if you're having you know frequent breakouts you should be on appropriate antiviral therapy um, but there really shouldn't be any issue there now with Zeljans th that was an issue uh, with uh, with having shingles uh, and having herpes virus outbreaks so uh, there was an issue there because of the potential immunosuppression in that agent Mm -hmm. Great. We talked a lot about the transition from biologics over to the new worlds. Uh, maybe we can touch on the transition or potential transition between topicals uh, in oral treatments. So this participant asked, how do you know when to change from creams to oral meds? Will all oral meds impact your long-term health, and is that the trade-off? Yeah, well, you know, topical therapies um, aren't, aren't just affecting your skin, especially, let's say, you're using large amounts of topical steroid on large amounts of body surface area, you know, you have some absorption of those as well, um, and they can impact your adrenal function. Um, so I don't think topical therapies are without potential side effects, and they're also not addressing systemic inflammation. So you know, one of the things you need to think about is what is the cost to your body of not treating your psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. And I really think as we found out more and more about the comorbidities associated with psoriasis, other conditions associated with psoriasis, about the inflammation associated with psoriasis, you really have to balance what's the cost of not treating your psoriasis. You know, I think someone that comes into me that has, you know, 10 or 15 percent of their psoriasis covered may have some early psoriatic arthritis. That patient to me, that person to me is at higher risk for cardiovascular disease, higher risk for other systemic inflammatory diseases, higher risk of having metabolic syndrome, um, high blood pressure, other things. So there's a cost to not controlling that inflammation. And we can't really quantify what that is, but it's real. Um, and I really think you need to think about the fact that you have a systemic inflammatory disease, and if you're not adequately controlling it, um, that could be a problem for you over time as well. Now, if you just have very mild disease and, you know, topical therapies are working for you, uh, you're not having any, you know, significant psoriatic arthritis symptoms, that's fine to continue with those. You don't need to go on to a systemic therapy. Or you may just do some localized light therapy. Um, you know, that's reasonable. But if you're starting to have true, uh, you know, systemic inflammation, you really need to get that under control. Great. Thank you. Uh, can a Tesla be effective at a lower dosage? It can in some patients. Um, now, the steady dosage, again, is the 30 milligrams twice a day, and that's what most patients need to achieve uh, the kind of results that we showed with that, you know, a little over 30 percent PASI 75 uh, improvement and with the psoriatic arthritis improvement. The lower dose with the psoriatic arthritis didn't work as well. It still worked, but it didn't work as well. So that was the 20 milligrams twice daily dose. So um, I think most people need 30 milligrams twice a day. I do have some elderly folks uh, who did very well up front with the Tesla twice a day, but we're still having a little bit of GI upset, and I've dropped them down to daily dosing, and they appear to be doing well. They've got to remember older people also metabolize things more slowly, um, so they may need less medicine than younger folks do. Um, but I think most patients are going to need the twice daily dosing to be able to maintain their skin and their joints where they want them to be. Great, thank you. Uh, we've had a number of questions as well about accessing um, Otesla. So are insurance companies covering this medication? Is it possible to get approval for it without first trying medications like methotrexate or Embrel first? So, good question, and you know the, the answer to that is uh, all over the map. So, yes, some insurance uh, companies require uh, other biologic treatment even. Uh, some require oral medicines or phototherapy that, that be uh, tried prior to uh, Otesla. Some do allow Otesla uh, as first-line therapy. And it's not even your insurer. Sometimes it's more the pharmacy benefit plan that you have. Uh, that really is making those decisions. And so even within an insurance plan, you can have you know, 20 or 30 different uh, pharmacy plans which are really separately managed, which may have completely different rules. 
So, you know, the answer to that is really patient-specific. Um, but it can be approved. I, I do have several insurance plans where I can use it first line. I have others where they require me to jump through multiple, multiple hoops uh, to get to a test. Dr. Crowley, do we know why Otesla causes appetite suppression and weight loss? We don't. Um, and, you know, I mentioned in, in the talk that there are, there are some theories. Um, you know, wh whether it's, it's working centrally or whether it's doing actually something to the adipocytes, the fat cells themselves. Uh, there is a model, um, I believe it was rats, um, where they looked at brown fat in, in the rats and uh, the rats treated with the phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor uh, had a little bit more activity uh, in their fat and, and, and had weight loss. Um, so there may be a role of a Tesla directly in the fat. Um, this is something that is being actively studied because there's a lot of interest uh, in this uh, in this quote unquote side effect uh, because you know many of our patients would like to be able to shed a, a few pounds and uh, having a drug where that can happen sometimes I think is it can definitely be helpful but the mechanism is really not known again it's not associated uh, with the nausea diarrhea issues up front so there's something else going on there. Um, and there are basically two ways you can lose weight, right? You either decrease what you take in or you increase what you put out, okay? So you either exercise more and burn more calories or you take less in. So it's affecting one of those mechanisms. Um, and I think it's probably more of an appetite suppressant to some extent than it is in, in terms of having any, uh, any kind of, uh, you know, amphetamine type effect on you, uh, you know, more appetite suppressant than, than increasing metabolism. Great. Thank you, Dr. Crowley. Dr. Crowley. That's all just my theory. There's, there's, you know, there's, there's no data supporting that as of now. But more stuff will come out over time. Thank you, Dr. Crowley. Looks like this is all the time we have for our webcast presentation this evening. Again, I want to thank Celgene for their sponsorship of today's educational webcast and for making this event possible. A recording of tonight's webcast will be available shortly on our website, and you can access our complete webcast archive by visiting psoriasis.org slash webcast. If you have any other questions, please feel free to contact our organization at education at psoriasis.org. Once you leave today's webcast, you will receive a survey on the presentation, and we would greatly appreciate it if you would please complete that and provide your feedback. So thank you to everyone for joining us tonight, and have a lovely evening.